So the purpose of no feet movements for throwing specifically. No feet movements will teach an athlete in the weight room how to apply force over a longer period of time. So everyone wants to be explosive, they want to be aggressive, they want to jump all over the circle, and they do the same thing in the weight room. And they land in precarious positions, bars out of place, footwork's out of place. But what a no feet teaches you, you're more connected to the bar, you're more connected to the floor. You're grounded for a longer period of time. That connection leads to a better feeling through the full lift, through the full acceleration period. And if the athlete can consistently learn through those drills in the weight room, how to apply force over a very long period of time, it can then transfer into the circle and they learn to stay grounded, they learn to enjoy being grounded, and they learn how to accelerate and implement using ground forces, not jumping all over the place. So that's the whole goal of no feet movements that we use in our training system at Garage Strength at Throws University. So what can we learn from drugged up athletes? First of all, I think we need to comprehend that many drugged up athletes are raised in they're in this culture of drugs, of steroids, of performance enhancement. This is no excuse, but their minds and their perception are considerably different from a culture where, like the United States, where drugs are, performance enhancing drugs are viewed so negatively. So, with that being said, what we can learn from them is training frequency and adapting that 10 to 20% for a normal athlete but also technique. And what I've found in weightlifting is some of the best drugged up athletes tended to have the best technique because they, they could recover a little bit quicker. They could use uh, variations a little bit more specifically and alter their technical movements so that they were very, very efficient and very, very effective. So I think the number one thing in weightlifting is, is technical study of these drugged up athletes. Now in throwing, most of the athletes that tested positive using somebody like Randy Barnes test positive twice Technique in the end of his career wasn't great. In the beginning of his career and in, in uh, when he broke the world record, his finish was excellent. Very grounded finish, solid out of the back, got down, wasn't a jumper in the beginning of part of his career. Um, so technique was available. And somebody like Ulf Timmerman, who I think is fairly well known that he used anabolic steroids, is also you know the technical model for glide. So in that regard, for sure, um, the technique is, is important, but then you look at like recent guys that may have tested positive within the last year and a half that won US indoors two years ago. His technique's trash. Technique was trash, and it was more about him getting as strong as he possibly could and then using that in the throw. So, um, in throwing, I think it's you can gain a little bit of technical knowledge as long as you're analyzing it, somebody like Ulf Timmerman, but then also you can see what maximum strength can do for throws. Because a lot of these guys, like Kevin Toth, this big, huge monster, who had just absurd amounts of maximal strength, of absolute strength, but terrible technique, still threw 74 feet when he was on steroids, right? So if we could sit there and say, okay, so max strength does help throw farther, and technique helps throw farther, and then, and then you use that, use that to unite with a clean athlete and then you adapt your program based around how your athlete is adapting to your system dependent upon the various stimulus. So technique, strength, ultimately though comes back to studying the, the technical models that some of these uh, roided up athletes may have created from drug usage. I think it's tough because a high school kid doesn't fully understand training and technique, most high school kids anyway. Um, but I think if you're in a system in high school that works relatively well, um, you've gotta have, again, you gotta have a coach that's gonna be like-minded and that has like-minded goals that communicate similar to the way that you feel that you respond well. Um, so if you respond well to maybe a little bit more aggressive cues and a little more critical cues, then you wanna find a coach that's similar in that regard. Or if you find somebody who's a little more chilled out, laid back, and more analytical, then you want to find a coach like that. But ultimately it comes back to, do they have a technical model? That should be the number one question. Who's their technical model or models for discus, for shot, for hammer, for um, javelin? And, and those models are established. What's your periodization model so that they can see what type of training they're going to be doing, 
um, volume and intensity, how many throws a week so you know going in how often am I going to be able to throw and, and train specifically for throwing each week. So those are all really important things that, that you've got to factor in. But ultimately you don't want a coach who's going to verbally abuse you and, and verbally criticize you. You don't want a coach who's going to potentially sexually assault you. You don't want a coach who's going to racially degrade you.